Okay. <clears throat> We've been looking at the Middle East. We're doing this because of what we see playing out before our eyes day by day. And we thought it would be uh, an appropriate time to address this topic from the scripture. So we've been looking at what we called it Middle East 101, <clears throat> an understanding of uh, the land of Israel, the nation of Israel, the nations around Israel, and what has happened over the millennium. Uh, I titled the lesson today, The Hostility Begins, and we want to look at the Middle East through the lens of Scripture. That's what, that's what we've been doing. The Middle East problem, that's been a problem that's existed for about 4,200 years. Every time we get a new president, he tries to solve the, the problem. And, uh, and I guess we can applaud that, that the attempt is made. But the problem will not be solved politically. So we're going to look at uh, Israel in the scripture again, in the book of Genesis. And then uh, in a little bit of that 4,200 year history. And then we will... Uh, the next time, look at a the hundred year secular look at the nation of Israel, the state of Israel, and the, the countries around it. Here's a book that I would recommend if you uh, if you like reading on these things. Uh, this is a book that you will find you will, you'll find this accurate to history. And you will find it uh, easy to understand, a concise history. And that's really what it is. Okay, did I mess this up? Can you still hear me? Okay. Two weeks ago, we, we looked at the uh, Abrahamic covenant. Let me get this straightened up out again in just a minute. We looked at the Abrahamic covenant. The Abra and we're going to do that again a little bit today. The, uh, the provisions of the Abrahamic covenant were repeated in, the, in other covenants. The land portion re repeated in the Palestinian covenant. The um, king portion repeated in the Davidic covenant. Uh, the people portion uh, was repeated. Uh, so the salvation portion was repeated in the new covenant. So the Abrahamic covenant is the overarching covenant and other covenants expounded a little bit more on that. So we're going to do a, a kind of a quick review of the Abrahamic covenant and look at the chosen people and the enemy of the chosen people. So what we're seeing play out in the news and on college campuses and in marches in our cities, what, we, what I'm observing in that is a level of hospitality, uh, hospitality, a le level of animosity that I did not believe existed. A level of anti-Semitism that just really has surprised me that that is existing here in America. <clears throat> I knew it existed some, just not to the level that we, we see, that I'm observing. Some of the narrative is this. And the animosity is coming with, with these statements. Israel is a colonial power that is occupying Arab land. That is absolutely false. That's the narrative. That's what the pundits are saying. That's what students on campuses are saying. That's what people are screaming in marches in our cities. It's absolutely false. Israel stole Arab lands and put Arabs in refugee camps. And if Israel would just let them have an Arab state, there could be peace. That is absolutely false. Every time Israel has offered a state, they have turned it down. They don't want a state. They want Israel dead. And a state is not going to help that. Israel pulled out of Gaza in, was it 2005? And what they were told... Pull out of Gaza, let us have independent rule, and you'll have peace. They did, and they didn't have peace. That was just one more stepping stone of trying to conquer the Jews. 
You've heard this. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Heard that being said? That is code, that is code for the removal of Israel from the Middle East at best. At worst, it's code for the annihilation of Israel. From the river to the sea, they're saying from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea, and if you're looking at it on a map, the Jordan River is right here, Mediterranean Sea right here, and Israel lives right in between. From the, from the river to the sea, Palestine shall be free is a way of saying, get rid of the Jews. Palestinian babies are as precious as Jewish babies. That is absolutely true. That's being said. And that is absolutely true. However, who was responsible for the deaths of the Palestinians? And who's responsible for the deaths of the Jewish babies? That's the issue. It's not an issue of one baby is more important than the other. They're both precious in the eyes of God. But who's responsible for the killing? The Middle East problems that we see will not be solved through politics, but I really think we should try politically, nationally, to do everything we can to try to help bring peace. And I suspect that there are many well-meaning people in our government and in the governments of other countries of the world that are trying to find a workable solution. There is just not a workable solution politically. There is a solution. God can change a heart. If people would get saved, then it, everything changes. Yeah. There are Palestinian Christians that love the Jews and love the, and love the, the Arabs. Yeah. There are Israeli Christians that love the Palestinians and love their own people, Israel. You know, God changes a heart. That's the answer. The Abrahamic covenant. Go to Genesis chapter 12. I'm going to do a quick review. God gave a covenant to Abraham. He's something that he was going to do for Abraham. And God will fulfill what, his, what he said he would do in his covenant. Look in chapter 12 and verse 7. And it's in chapter 12, starting in verse 1, where we start seeing the, the beginnings of the Abrahamic covenant. But in, in verse 7, And the Lord appeared to Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land, and there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Now go over to chapter 13 and look in verse 15. Here's a repeat. For all the land which thou seest, God talking to Abram, all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, he shall, uh, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it, and in the breadth of it, for I will give it to thee. Now some claim that the Abrahamic covenant is not an unconditional covenant. It's a, they claim that it's a conditional covenant. Meaning, if the Jews did this, then God would do this. That's what a conditional covenant would be. They say this, and they're, and they're quoting scripture. God says to Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make thee a great nation, etc., etc. So the condition is, you have to leave the land of your nativity and family and go to the land I'm telling you and then I will do this well I can understand why they would say that's a condition I think I would call it a precondition because if he did that then God said he would do what he was going to do there are no other conditions tied to it Abraham you leave the land of your nativity go to the promised land and this is what I'll do that's exactly what he did he obeyed I, I would view it more like this. It is an invitation. God is inviting Abraham to join in this unconditional covenant. So how, what did Abraham do? He stepped out in faith 
trusting God at his word, left the land of his nativity, went to the land of Canaan, and God then performed the Abrahamic covenant, which has no conditions attached to it. So Abraham believed God. He accepted what God said. And in summary, the covenant was a promise was made to Abraham and to his seed, that is, his descendants. It was an unconditional covenant. It was a unilateral covenant with God himself being the one that fulfilled the specifics of the Abrahamic covenant. And he shows us that in the covenant ceremony in Genesis chapter 15. In fact, the word covenant, the word covenant comes from a, the word to cut. That's what it means, to cut. A covenant means to cut. And in Genesis chapter 15, God told Abraham to take a young cow, a heifer, a female goat, a ram, and two birds, and the birds, one turtle dove and one pigeon, take those animals and cut them in two, except the birds. Cut the heifer, cut the ram, uh, cut them in two and put half we put one half of the bloody animal there and one half of the bloody animal there. Put one bird, put the pigeon there, put the turtle dove there. Create a path through the blood. And then what normally would happen in a covenant ceremony, and this is just a normal Middle East covenant, covenant ceremony. This isn't a special ceremony designed uniquely by God for this event. This is the way covenants were made. They cut the animals, they put the bloody halves, and then the two people making the covenant with each other would hold hands and walk the bloody path between the cut animals. And they would make certain vows, oaths to each other. I will do this. I will do that. Okay, I will do this. And I, I'll do that. And they pledged under oath that they would do it. And it was a serious matter because they're walking through the blood. They violated they lose their life by blood. That's the way covenants were made. But when it came time to walk the bloody path, God put Abram in a deep sleep, and God walked the path by himself. What does that mean? God is binding himself under an oath to fulfill the requirements of the Abrahamic covenant. It is not dependent upon Abraham. Abraham didn't walk the path holding hands with God, agreeing to do certain things as God made an oath of what he was going to do. God took it all upon himself. It was not and is not dependent upon Abraham or his descendants. If it was dependent upon Abraham and his descendants, then it's a conditional covenant. But it wasn't. Abraham never participated in the covenant ceremony. God put him in a sleep, and he did it himself. It was an everlasting covenant. He said, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. Now, you really have to go to seminary to learn that the word forever doesn't mean forever. And that doesn't help you. You know, you have to go to the university today to learn that there's a hundred different genders. You know, before you go to university, you, you, you understand there's two, male and female. You go to university and you learn there could be a hundred, could be 80, could be 50. It depends on the university you go to and the teacher that's teaching the class. You have to go to a school of higher education to learn that men can get pregnant. Anybody with the lick of sense knows that that doesn't happen. And you, sometimes you, you have to go to seminary. It sounds like I'm against seminary. I'm not against seminary at all. But if you go to seminary and learn that forever doesn't mean forever, that's a problem. If you go to seminary and you learn, for God so loved the world, but the world doesn't mean the world. The world means the world of the elect. That's a problem. I would rather take God at his word for what he says and not to try to explain it away to make it fit certain narrative. 
God promised a land to Israel. He promised, promised it to Abraham and to his descendants, and Israel is his descendants. And on the map up here is the promised land. God gave the, the borders to the promised land, and, and it is the coast of the Mediterranean, and then it was over in the Transjordan, on the other side of the Jordan River, all the way up to the Euphrates River and to the River of Egypt. Now, there's a debate. Right there is the River of Egypt, a river that is called the River of Egypt. And some hold that that is the extent of the, the southern border of the land of Israel, and others hold to the River of Egypt was referring to the Nile. And I don't know which one it refers to, but it goes all the way to the River of Egypt all the way to the Euphrates River. We know that for sure. We know where the Mediterranean Sea is. We know where the Transjordan is. That is the land that God gave Israel, and they never in their history occupied all of it. They could have. That was a matter of, of obedience. But they never put out the effort to occupy the land all the way to the Euphrates River. So, uh, so how did Abraham understand the Abrahamic covenant? Now, that's important. God made the covenant with Abraham. How did he understand it? How did he interpret what God said? Well, we have that. Go with me to Genesis chapter 24. And here, Abraham is instructing his servant, Eleazar, to go back to Aram to get a wife for his son, Isaac. And Abraham is repeating some of the and Isaac is repeating, I'm sorry, Abraham is repeating some of the, the Abrahamic covenant to his servant Eleazar. And he says in chapter 24, verse 7, the Lord God of heaven which took me from my father's house. That's Ur of the Chaldees over in Mesopotamia. And from the land of my kindred and which spake unto me and that swear, that means he made an oath to me. He swore an oath. That's what the word means. He made an oath to me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land, and uh, he shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. And if the woman will not, will not be willing to follow thee, then thou shalt be clear from this my oath. Only bring not my son thither again. Don't take my son Isaac out of the promised land. Eleazar, I need you to go to Aram. Get a wife for Isaac. Don't take Isaac there because God gave us this land here. Abraham understood what God said when God told him, I'm giving you and your descendants this land. And he expected Isaac to then be the owner of the land when he was gone. So God made a covenant Abraham understood it. God was going to give his seed a new land. To say that God made this a conditional covenant is almost to accuse God of deceiving Abraham. And why would God record, if, 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 it, if God did it conditionally, and Abraham thought it was unconditional, and he repeats it, why didn't God correct Abraham's misunderstanding of what he said? He didn't correct Abraham's misunderstanding. He didn't correct that. I mean, how would you act? How would you respond if you gave what you thought was clear instructions to somebody, and they repeated the instructions back, and they had it wrong? What would you do? You would turn around, walk away, kind of snickering, saying, huh, he misunderstood that. Tough. No, you wouldn't. If, if he misunderstood your clear instruction, you would make it clearer. You would say it again. You would explain. You would tr try to convey what you really meant. Now, wouldn't God do the same? Or would God just write down Abraham's misunderstanding and go his merry way? No. Abraham didn't misunderstand it. He got it right. He got it right because it was an unconditional covenant promised to him and his seed after him, which means Isaac was going to get it. That's what we would do. It's certainly what God did. 
the chosen people. Who is the promised son of Abraham? If the land is given to Abraham and his descendants through a promised son, who is that son? Abraham had that question because at the time he received the, the Abrahamic covenant, he had no children. And it was going to be quite a while before he had children. He didn't know that. But he wondered who this, this promised son descendant would be. And, and so Abraham is going to try to help God out. He, he helped God out by suggesting that a logical solution to being old and childless would be for Eleazar of Damascus, a servant that was born in Abraham's household. So, Ab so Eleazar's parents were already in the employment of Abraham, and Eleazar was born in his household. Hey, God, let it be Eleazar born in my house, the, the heir. And in Genesis chapter 15, verse 4, God lets Abraham know, uh, not buying that. And behold, verse 4, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir. Okay? It's not Eleazar. It's not the servant that's born in your house. That was something Abraham was offering to God. Maybe this is the way you're going to do it, God. Nope, not doing it that way. But he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. God reassured Abraham that the heir was going to be a son born from his own bowels. That means the son is going to be a biological son of Abraham's. Abraham is going to father that child. Not a servant in the household, but someone that is his biological child. Then God confirmed that with the covenant ceremony of cutting the animals. And so Abraham knew that he's going to have a seed. It's going to be a son. Later, he tries to help God out again. All right, it's, it's not Eleazar. Um, let's do it like this. Okay, God? <laughs> I'll have a child by Sarah's handmaid young Hagar and, uh, and that can be the, the chosen one now that didn't come from Abraham it really came from Sarah she gave she concocted the plan and she she wants Abraham to father a child through Hagar her Egyptian handmaid and then Abraham would have a son of his own bowels and he did that and he had a son of his own bowels, Ishmael by name. Abraham, so, so that happened. Abraham was now 99. Sarah was 89. Ishmael is 13. And God informs Abraham that the promised son is not going to be Ishmael. The promised son is going to come through Sarah, not Hagar. Not just a biological son, it had to be a biological son through her, through Sarah. Chapter 17, look with me in verse 5. Neither, 17, 5, neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I met, made thee. All right, there's going to be many nations that come from Isaac, and from Ishmael. Verse 6, And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee, and I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and their generations for a... Oh, what kind of covenant? Oh, it's an everlasting covenant. Now, you got to go to seminary to learn that everlasting doesn't mean everlasting. No, it means everlasting. For an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. Now, Abraham was still doubtful because of Sarah's old age, her advanced age, and his advanced age, so he offered the suggestion of Ishmael as the heir. Look in verse 18, chapter 17, verse 18. And Abram said unto God, O, o that Ishmael might live before thee, and God said, Sarah, 
Thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for a, for what? For an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. And as for Ishmael, I've heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him. I will make him fruitful and multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time next year. So it happened. Isaac was born just as God said. Years passed. Sarah's died. More years passed. Abraham is now doing his end-of-life planning. You know, it's a wise thing to prepare for the end of your life. And you should do end-of-life planning. And to have a health care power of attorney, it's a smart thing, isn't it? And to have a will to dispense your earthly goods and keep them out of probate court is a smart thing, isn't it? It's end-of-life planning that we do. Abraham's doing some end-of-life planning. Look with me in chapter 25 and verse 5. Abraham is old. He knows the end is coming. And so he starts making some arrangements. And Abraham, verse 5, gave all that he had unto Isaac and unto the sons of the concubines, Hagar, Keturah, maybe others, which Abram, Abraham had, Abraham gave gifts and sent them away from Isaac, his son, while he yet lived. All right, Abraham's still living, and so he's making these arrangements to set up Isaac for success. And so he gives everything he has to Isaac, but he gives gifts to his other children, and then he sends them away eastward unto the east country that is east of the promised land now let me give you another map here you see here you see the land that is Isaac is inheriting that's the promised land that is bound up in the Abrahamic covenant the, the blue but then he gives land to Ishmael you know Ishmael got more land and probably more wealth monetarily than Isaac and, and he became extremely wealthy and a large number of descendants came from Ishmael that lived throughout the, the Arabian Peninsula it was a strategic piece of land because the trade routes the trade routes came through this territory and across the desert and you had to know the path through the desert and Ishmael's descendants could control those trade routes the trade routes also came ar around the, the coast and up and they could control that and they were merchants tradesmen and they became extremely wealthy because they had a strategic piece of land and, and in the south of the Arabian Peninsula very fertile spices that, that the world sought after came from that territory so Isaac remains in Canaan Ishmael dwells in the east and we're given the names of Ishmael's 12 sons who became the leaders of nations that's recorded in the scripture Abraham is, is now gone he's died he's been buried Isaac and Ishmael together got together and they buried their father and now the focus of the scripture then shifts and it points to Isaac that's where the scriptures are looking that's where God is dealing Isaac is living in Canaan and he experiences strife with the Philistines who also live in a part of Canaan and God says to Isaac chapter 26 look with me in verse 24 after Isaac is, has this struggle with the Philistines over the land and the Lord appeared unto him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bless thee and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. Isaac is going to be blessed because of Abraham. Abraham's sake. He's the recipient of the covenant promises. 
because God is being truthful to Abraham. So he passes it on to Isaac. From a human standpoint, God is going to honor the covenant because Abraham was a faithful man and stepped out and did the precondition or accepted the invitation of the Abrahamic covenant. But from a divine standpoint, God's going to honor the Abrahamic covenant because God gave an oath. And God keeps his word. Isaac has two sons, Esau and Jacob. And while the twins are in Rebekah's womb, God tells her that two nations are inside of her. And the elder is going to serve the younger. Esau was the firstborn. And Jacob, twin, right after him. So the blessing... The right of inheritance would naturally go to Esau. But not valuing the importance of the blessing and the birthright, Esau sold his birthright to Jacob for a bowl of soup because he was hungry. He was a fleshly man. He wasn't of the substance that God was going to bless him with the blessing and the recipient of the Abrahamic covenant. At age 40, Esau married two Hittite women, and they became a grief to Isaac and Rebekah. Jacob swindles Esau out of the blessing from, from Isaac, and then he flees Esau's murderous wrath. He's 77 years old when this happens. And Rebekah sends Jacob away to Aram. That's all the way back up here, north of the promised land, where her ancestors are from where she came from. He sends him there to get a wife, or, or to live, just to get out of town, not to uh, suffer from Esau. So he goes to the land of Rebekah's nativity. At age 84, he marries Leah and Rachel. And then he begins having 12 sons, and he returns to the promised land at age 97. He resettles back in Canaan. Now, He's back, he's back in the promised land, resettling in Canaan. God assures him that he's going to be with Jacob. Jacob was a deceiver. He had a checkered past. He wasn't the kind of guy that you would um, invite home to date your daughter. He, he, was, he wasn't a good man. But through the trials of life, God was changing him. God was molding him. He was making him what he needed to be. And he comes back to the promised land a better behaved man than when he left. God appears to him. Chapter 35, let's go there. In verse 9. Chapter 35 and verse 9. And, and God appeared unto Jacob again when he came out of Padanaram. That's, he comes back at age 97 with, with wives and 12 sons and a daughter and flocks galore and God said unto him thy name is Jacob that means deceiver You're, you are the deceiver yeah. he deceived Isaac and got the blessing that was supposed to go that would have gone to Esau thy name is Jacob deceiver thy name shall not be called any more Jacob but Israel struggler with God that's, that's what your name's going to be now. Israel. And he called his name Israel, and God said unto him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply a nation, and a company of nations shall be in thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. Have you heard that before? And the land which I gave to Abraham and Isaac, to thee I will give it, and to thy seed after thee I will give the land. Folks, it keeps going this way, all the way to the end of, of Genesis. Same thoughts over and over again. God tells Jacob to go down to Egypt. Once he found out Joseph was alive in Egypt, God told Jacob not to be afraid to go down to Egypt. In Egypt, you're going to become a great nation, and I'm going to bring you home again to the promised land. That's in Genesis 46. At the end of his life, Jacob is blessing his family, and he repeats the Abrahamic covenant. And he says in chapter 48, verse 4, you want to look there. He says in chapter 48, verse 4, and Jacob's about saying about God, and, and said unto me, Behold, 
I make thee fruitful and multiply thee, and I will make thee a multitude of people and will give this land to thy seed after thee for a, for an, a what? An everlasting possession. Jacob dies and he's buried back in the promised land. They take his body back there and then back to Egypt. And now jo Joseph lives out the remainder of his days. His brothers live out the remainder of their days. And, and Joseph gets to the end of his life. Now we're in the last chapter of the book of Genesis. Look in chapter 50, verse 24. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die, and God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land unto the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I mean, from Genesis chapter 12 all the way to Genesis chapter 50, over and over and over again, this Abrahamic covenant is referred to and it is, it is an unconditional covenant. God is going to do it. Now, if we were to step back, folks, and try to get a bird's eye view of Genesis, I mean, just step back, the 20,000 foot view, you're looking at the book of Genesis, this is what you'll see. The first 11 chapters of Genesis, God uses to cover how he created everything. He created the heavens and the earth, he created the plant kingdom and the animal kingdom, and he, and he created man and woman, and he brought them together in a marriage, a man and a woman. He then um, destroyed much of his creation with a flood. He started all over with Noah. You get the Tower of Babel and how he divided the earth and the people groups by confounding their languages where they couldn't communicate with each other. All this is happening in 11 chapters. These are momentous events. And then for the next 39 chapters of the book of Genesis, he uses to deal with the chosen people, who the chosen people are and, who, and what he was going to do with the chosen people. Now, if we wrote the book of Genesis, we wouldn't do that. We'd spend 39 chapters about creation and all these momentous events and then a little bit about the family at the end. But God didn't approach it that way. Then the Bible records repeatedly genealogies, mostly Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their descendants. There should be no question regarding who the chosen people are. Muslims believe that the Israelites were never the chosen people but that they falsified the true record and that Ishmael and his descendants are the true chosen people and the recipients of the Abrahamic covenant. Are they right? Not according to Genesis. Not according to Jesus. Well, how, what did Jesus have to say about it? In, in Matthew chapter 22, Jesus said the following, but as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken of unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Jesus put his finger on Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of the Bible is not the God of Ishmael, Esau, Muhammad, and the Muslims. Jehovah God and Allah are two separate gods. They are not two names for the same God. Allah is Arabic, an Arabic word that means God. That's what Allah means, God. But it is not Jehovah God. They're not one in the same. They're vastly different. And if you ever hear someone say this, well, the God of the Bible and the God of the Muslims, Allah and, and, and God, they're the same one. They're just worshiping differently. Then you know right away, the person that said that has not read the Bible with understanding. And they haven't even read history in that regard, in the Middle East, and, or the holy books. They're just not the same. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah and their descendants are the chosen people of God. So let's be clear. Ishmael, 
Esau, Muhammad, and Muslims are not the chosen people. But neither are Americans, or American Indians, or Englishmen, or Japanese, or Koreans, or Vietnamese, or Laotians, or Eskimos, or Icelanders, or of any other people group. We're, we're not the chosen people either. So it's not being prejudiced against the Muslims to say they're not the chosen people. It's just, they're not. But neither are we. The enemy of the chosen people. Have you ever made a bad decision? Too many, huh? You know, a decision not, a decision can not only affect you, it can affect your family and it can affect your descendants. Some sins, some blessings are generational. In fact, a lot of blessings are generational. You live right and you can be a blessing to your kids and your grandkids and, and that gets passed along and the influence, the blessed influence gets passed along and that's a, a help. But some sins are generational, meaning the consequences are weighty and get passed on. I believe that we must have a generational view of life. We ought not look just me and my wife and that's it. No, we, we ought to look at our influence upon our, our greater family. And so I, I really am interested in generational influence. I want to influence my daughter. She's married. She has her own family. She has three kids, three grandkids. But I want to influence them. I want to invest in their life. I want to help my daughter and my son-in-law give every opportunity for those kids, grandkids, to grow up knowing God and loving God and living for God. So I, I put together a, uh, a little genealogy. Uh, I've been doing this over the years, trying to collect information from family members. So I start all the way at the bottom of my grandkids and then... And then my, my, uh, my daughter right here and her husband, Susan and I right here, my parents right here, and I, I go back. I've got it back now to 1772. That's how far I, I can trace it back with a lot of pictures, actually. And, uh, and in the studies, here's what I found out. And, and Lydia Gould and Robert Young, not the actor, this is a different Robert Young, <laughs> and Lydia Gould, they had a bunch of kids. Pascal Paoli. Now, I have no idea why you'd name your kid Pascal Paoli. P uh, Simeon, Anna, Anson, Gilbert Festus. Loyal. That's a unique name, Loyal. And then there's Mehedable. Now, she's the one that is in my direct family line, Mehedable. But her brother, Loyal, he had a, I found he had a son, Hall Young. And, and uh, we even have a book on him, Hall Young. Of Alaska, he was a Presbyterian missionary and went to Alaska to evangelize the people in Alaska. And in his auto, in his autobiography, page twenty one, he says this: "It doth not run in the young family to get rich." Now he passed that down for sure. <laughs> I understand that one. <laughs> but he goes on to say, among our remoter kin, the name Brigham Young does not arouse a high feeling of pride. So I found out that somewhere back there, there is a relation to Brigham Young. Not that I would boast in that. He was one of the founders of Mormonism, led the Mormons to Salt Lake City. But I, I send this to my daughter, and I have her interested in generational things. It's important to me to have generational influence. Folks, influence your kids. Influence your grandkids. Just went to back to West Virginia for Thanksgiving and my daughter and her family were there and there, and which is five and then Susan and I so seven of us had Thanksgiving together and uh, we, we sit down to pray to eat we all hold hands we pray and thank God for his blessings and then when the prayer was over before we even started passing food my son-in-law said I, I'd like to say something and uh, he looked at his three kids and he said I did not behave properly yesterday. I, I jumped to a conclusion too quick, and I was wrong, and I want you to know that, that I was wrong, and I ask you to forgive me. And the three little kids, 10, 
9 and 7. Quick to forgive, Dad. Now I'm observing this and I'm thinking, those kids need to hear that. They, they, they need, when we make a mistake, our family needs to hear us own up to that and ask forgiveness. We need to exhibit the kind of behavior we want them to grow up with. We need to model it so they, so they understand. I want my kids to understand this is the way ale stocks live. Or uh, my son-in-law wants them to understand this is the way Allens live. And so he's building family identity into them. We're doing everything we can to have a righteous influence on the generation. Righteous behavior can have a generational impact, but so can sinful behavior. When I hear of a father going to jail, when I hear of a couple getting divorced, I wonder what impact that's going to have on their children. When someone praises carnal behavior and gives a like to something that is carnal, I wonder what effect will that have on the people that see that? Maybe people in their own family or people that they have influence over. Life is going to get hard enough for the ch children and especially those whose parents make grave errors and don't correct them. And we see that with Abraham. He made a grave error. And his descendants to this day live with that grave error. And it hurts. We'll look at that next time we, we meet. And we're going to discuss that. You know what the error is. We're, we're just going to go beyond that and see how that played out post-biblical times, even up to modern times. We're going to see what's happening. You look at the Middle East and people that are, have no biblical understanding, they question, what is going, why can't they get along? The answer is in the Bible. Why they don't get along. And it goes all the way back to the book of Genesis and some seeds that were sown and they've born a crop of destruction. Let's be careful with the way we live life, with the decisions that we make, with the behaviors that we exhibit. Now, who, who among us in here doesn't make mistakes? We all make mistakes. But when we make them, let's, let's own up to it. And let's own up to it to our kids. And own up to it to our grandkids. And... Uh, God can even use that to help the next generation and the generation after that. So these are important. This, this is important stuff. It's what life is made out of: family, relationships, and passing on our faith. Well, I pray that you have a wonderful second half of the week. God bless you for being here. Why don't we stand and we'll close in prayer? And uh, next time we we meet, which will not be next week, I think next week is a. Is it a play? Elementary. Concert. Next week is elementary concert. So the week after that is when we will look at uh, really the last hundred years, what's transpired that, that sets up the map and the stage as you see it today. That's what we're going to, we're going to build the case and what, what went on, how Israel got back in the land and what were the, the dominoes that were put in place to make that happen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. It's true. We hold to it. We love it, God. We, we want to live by it. We want to walk in its precepts. And God, we need you. We need strength that comes from you. God, would you make us sensitive to sin? Would you, would you help us as we strive to do right and live in a holy way? Lord, I pray our influence would be impacting on those that are around us, especially those of our own household. 